Welcome to the Mike Clegg podcast and today I'm really pleased to have Diane Medal as my guest. Welcome Diane. Hi, hi Mike, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. So Diane, she's had an amazing career, she's um, uh, an athlete, uh, she was competed in athletics, she was an 800 meter runner, she was uh, a four times Olympian, um, she won the gold medal in the Commonwealth Games and she's been all types of accolades from the AAA, European Championships, Commonwealth Games, Olympics and it's a real pleasure to have my first um, lady on the show also so <laughs> that's a great honour so thank you for joining us Diane. Pleasure. Okay so first of all you was born in 1966. Yeah. <laughs> you was always going to be destined for success in that sense because obviously England won the World Cup in 1966 and here come uh, you, you, you yourself was born and um, I suppose you as a young girl growing up, you you went to school. You you obviously um, enjoyed sports, but what actually got you towards the um, the running aspect or the athletics? You know, did, did you play much in the way of netball or football yourself, or anything like that? Uh, I grew up in Mosside in Manchester, and my entry or journey into sport was pretty random really. Mm. I went to uh, Manchester Academy High School, it was called Ducey High School then, mm. and during a typical PE lesson we just did whatever we were doing at the time, I think we were running outside on the marked out car park of the track and at the end of that session a volunteer coach who had been invited to come and watch that session came over to me and said you've got some potential, would you like to join a running club? And and that's where my journey in athletics started. I didn't really know what potential was or what a running club was. I was 11 years old, first year in high school, and, and that's where that journey started. Yeah, it's quite interesting you're saying that, and especially relating back to football, there's kids out there playing football, and they're just doing it for fun because they love it, and then sometimes a scout might come or a coach might come along and say, I'll tell you what, you've got potential, and uh, it can really help you to move on with the rest of your career. So you got sort of scouted, somebody spotted you, 11 so what transition did that say where did this how did they train you so for three days <coughs> a week every week Alan would pick me up from where we lived in Longside and drive me over to the suburbs of Sale Sale Harriers in Cheshire and uh, he did that for about seven years actually until uh, number one my parents could afford the bus uh, uh, that it, it would cost us to, to me, for me to go on my own but also um, until I had the confidence to be able to take the bus on my own mm. as well so Alan was somebody who really set in place what it meant to be committed he was there three days a week taking me to competitions and, and enabling that journey and mm. I suppose what I was doing at the club was learning my skills mm. learning how to run how to jump how to throw so I did all the sports and it, it becomes very clear um, in terms of where your passion is and what the coaches are advising you what your best event is going to be and and that led to various competitions and then being challenged more uh, regionally and then mm. nationally mm. and then getting a, an England vest. So it's quite interesting so you grew up in Moss Side and I can imagine back then um, just in and around the area did you feel almost like you was, you was plucked out of somewhere which could have been um, an awkward area to be brought up in, in the sense of um, you had an athletic ability, but you probably saw some things in around your area which wasn't nice, And but you was lucky enough to get an opportunity to maybe um, escape that. Mosside is a great place to grow up, to live, to be part of a brilliant community. That's where I grow up, that's where a lot of my family still live now. And you know, the headlines will, will want us to say something different. Mm. The headlines will probably want to steer us in a direction that this is a place full of no hope. Mm. But actually, Mosside, Hume, Old Trafford, mm. Manchester is the opposite of that. It's full of hope, it's full of opportunity. but there are also challenges as well um, and as a team as a community and if we get our opportunities right we can continue to not only discover talented young people through sport and education or whatever that might be but just to provide a safe place for people to live and, and feel happy Mosside's a great place no I agree and I have this similar thing with Termside where I'm from and a lot of people put downers on the areas you're from they seem rough in the press it looks like they're, they're terrible places but really it, it's, it's a it's a, a cauldron where there's great 
create opportunities if people get the opportunity and a lot of the time people get passed by and you, you, you was very much in that and so many sportsmen have come from that region as well you know so you get the opportunity you go down to sail you start training really hard and I, I suppose you, you like you say you start with your local competitions and you you must be winning them you must be um, getting fitter getting stronger I, I imagine you're doing strength and conditioning as well as just running or was it mainly running based back then mm. I don't think we were that far ahead in terms of strength and conditioning we, were we must probably, have done press ups and stuff we were probably doing it but yeah. it wasn't called that fancy title oh, at that stage training then yeah training we did the few uh, the odd tricep dips and that would yeah. be enough for strength and conditioning um, but it was mainly running based and learning and applying our skills mm. so um, it, it turns out that my specialist event was going to be 800 metres so a half miler was my event uh, and so in order to be good at that you need to be uh, uh, good at sp speed you mm. need to have a decent amount of speed but also you need the strength of a miler so a typical training for me would be about 40 miles a week running 40 wow. miles a week at that stage um, but then as I became an international it then moved up to running up to 70 to 80 miles a week so yeah. predominantly running base but then lots of strength lots of conditioning mm. nutrition rest and recovery gym based work hill sessions so that just surprises me so many miles in such a short distance really so well, that's quite interesting I wonder whether that's changed over the years whether the sort of the sprinters or the, the the middle distances do that many miles these days they probably do more really to be honest because you, you can't fake results you no. can't win medals overnight you have to put the work in yeah. and depending on your event uh, the work will be tailored to that event so clearly um, as a miler as a 10,000 meter runner as a marathon runner you, you need to be able to get the mileage and the road mileage in your legs so that come those key decision uh, times within a race you've got the strength to not only hold your pace and your speed mm -hmm. but to actually kick on again as well so that's why the mileage and the just basic good conditioning is crucial uh, in the middle and long distance events. Brilliant. So that, that young coach um, takes you in, uh, he's, he's grassroots, he's obviously not getting paid and um, back then it was very, um, in the sense of the athletes were really good, we had a golden age back then, the likes of Seb Cole, um, Steve Cram, all the other greats, yourself in amongst that and there must have been a real good feeling but at what age did you really have a that thought process or that feeling like I can get to the Olympics and because even at 16 17 18 you probably went through some tough times mm. I was probably about 15 years old when I actually articulated out loud that I shared that I wanted to go to the Olympic Games nice. And um, I remember at that stage, because I'd been training since then, since the age of 11, it felt very tangible and very real to me. Mm. But it wasn't until um, I was about 19 that I actually fully and totally committed to that journey. Mm. And that's when I really got my head down and started to work uh, productively to get to the Olympic Games. So there's a stepping process then, I suppose you had to win the English Championships, did you? Yeah. And then yeah. you had to, then you, you had probably had the opportunity to go to maybe the European Championships, Commonwealth Games. Have you got any like key moments in your mind which you really remember, like sliding door moments where you thought, wow, that's a major achievement for myself? That would probably be at the age of 19 when I won my first global medal. It was nice. a silver. Okay. And I remember actually feeling quite dissatisfied really? with, 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 with that silver medal even though it was the first medal I had ever won on wow. a major scale. Where was that? It was in Edinburgh, nice. it was in Scotland, Commonwealth Games and I just was so close to winning gold. I realised that if I applied myself, if yeah. I focused and committed, I actually could win a gold medal. And um, I knew I had four years to convert that silver medal to a gold one. And 
it literally happened in my mind first instantly and then I started to put all the work in well that's amazing because I've been like uh, with you we work together as well we're working on the Diamond Medal Sports Foundation we'll talk about that later but I was speaking to school yesterday and trying to get children to not just think what they want to be in the future but really emotionally feel that and that's what you did when you was in Edinburgh you're saying you know you had that feeling a bit disappointed winning silver in Commonwealth Games which is a major achievement for some people that that would be enough but therefore you put a four year training plan plan um, to make sure that you can be the best you could be. Was, was the four years later the Commonwealth Games in Auckland, is that the one? That's right, yeah. So tell us about that then. So you go to Auckland, it's the other side of the world, you put four years in there, you've thought about you in your own mind, you're manifesting what you want to happen and then it comes to the, the, the big event. Well, what I realised after winning that silver medal was being a winner happens in your mind first. Mm. So my coach had always been saying to me, Diane, you've got potential. You could go wherever you want to take it mm. in this sport. Mm. But I wasn't buying into it. I wasn't quite ready. Um, there are lots of pressures when you're a kid growing mm. up. Mm. Your friends, your mates are going out on a Saturday night, but you know you've got to be up in the morning to do a 13 miler. And uh, there's lots of considerations. My parents were saying, you've got to get a trade, you've got to go to college, mm. get an education. But I had this coach who I respected enormously saying, you could be one of the best athletes in the world. Uh, so after winning that silver, in my mind, I thought, I'm gonna knuckle down and give this my best shot. Yeah. And the minute I made that decision, my parents were backed me 100%. And so arriving in the Commonwealth Games in 1990, I was actually the favorite to win that gold medal. Wow. Um, because my preparation up until that time meant that I was unbeaten by any other British athlete uh, for six consecutive seasons over wow. my specialist distance yeah. I was number one in the Commonwealth and I was actually so excited I just could not wait to get this show on the road and um, it didn't go quite according to plan actually really? ten days before this uh, race that I had announced to the world that I would win nice. I was beaten I was beaten by one of my biggest rivals wow. Sharon Stewart from mm -hmm. Australia she was a 400 meter specialist moving up a distance uh. and uh, she beat me over 600 meters I broke the British record so I knew I was in peak performance but mentally that just knocked yeah. me out it just played with my mind because I wasn't prepared for that I had been unbeaten for so long and so on the morning of the race even to uh, the starter saying on your marks i still wasn't entirely sure how i was going to win that race. was you in that race yeah oh so this is a real turning point eh? so you had to keep your your calm you had to make sure you stayed relaxed make sure you put all in years of training and then obviously the gun goes off mm. and she was the only she was only one of seven competitors who i was particularly nervous about yeah. um the gun does go off and immediately when the the gun goes off I know that I'm going to do what I've done in every other race go to the front stay there and don't let anyone come past me Excellent. and um, I led from gun to tape actually and crossed the line first it was still a very very tight race my English competitor Anne Williams came second the Australian got third and I broke the Commonwealth record winning gold it was amazing congratulations yes <laughs> love you. that it's a great success story so now that must have been amazing but when you finish that I suppose you're absolutely elated but your body the lactic acid going through your body at the same time did you feel fatigued after your races was it was you or was you just so used to that distance that you could almost do another one really well when I reflect on it now there are three things that I can vividly recall feeling the first was relief yeah four years in the making to execute this plan yeah. it was a relief that it had actually come through my coach was in England he couldn't make it to to New Zealand so it was really a sense of relief mm. for him the second feeling was one of pride you never achieve anything on your own mm. however big or small and and there was a huge team of people behind me my coach my family um, everybody who had played a real big part in that mm. success so it was a feeling of pride that we collectively achieved this gold medal yeah, and good. the third 
third feeling was um, emotion. Mm. Emotion. So absolutely a bit fatigued, but also um, just happy and excited. Yeah, well, just that flush of neurochemicals going through the body for winning must be amazing. It's very hard to um, replicate them feelings in normal life, but obviously you was a um, very famous runner, you were very successful, and you went to four Olympic Games as well, didn't you? So you went to Seoul in 88, you went to Barcelona in 92, Atlanta in America in 96, and Sydney in 2000. So that itself is a bit of a higher level, and I suppose going to them competitions and because you know your times compared to other people, you probably knew you wasn't going to win them, but I suppose you, you had a feeling of being able to try and become the best you could be within mm. that. So how did you go mindset that in, within that type of environment? Actually, you never go into a race knowing you are not going to win. Oh, good. Regardless of who's in the race, otherwise why are you there? So realistically, you have your own plan and you have your own achievements and targets, but you know, my main competitors were the likes of Dame Kelly Holmes. Mm. I mean, she wasn't a dame then. And uh, uh, Maria Matola from Mozambique, yeah. Anna Kiro from Cuba, Jarmila Kratokvilova from Czechoslovakia, mm. who still holds the world record wow. for my event. Yeah. Powerhouses, just true powerhouses of, of, of the 800 meter event and classic examples in how you win. But every time I stepped on the line with those women, my mind mindset was I can win this race mm. uh, and that's the only mindset that matters because that's the only thing that you can control internally and uh, it's every athlete's dream to not only uh, compete in the Olympic Games but be the best that you can in the mm. Olympic Games and I was fortunate to uh, uh, compete in four of them and finish seventh in my highest uh, positioning at the Games but all of them mean so much for so many different reasons and I'm very privileged to have been able to experience that. So can you pick out some type of interesting story or something which you've stuck with you as being, it couldn't be a something funny for the Olympic Games you must have seen some crazy things some interesting things and maybe some we hear the, these stories about the the Olympic camp and once people have finished they go and party and bits and pieces <laughs> well the thing that I probably recall the most is the first games that I went to in 88 in yeah. Seoul it was a, a golden generation of athletics at the mm -hmm. time, so uh, on the team was Linford Christie, oh. Jonathan Edwards, Sally Gunnell, Yvonne Murray, Colin Jackson, yeah. um, so the likes of individuals who not only went on to win Olympic Games and, and gold medals, uh, but it was our first Games, our first Olympic Games for all of us, yeah. and we would meet every night in the village on a patch of grass, Jonathan Edwards would have his guitar out. Nice, really? and he, yeah, there'd be brilliant. me and Sally and um, Jonathan and Colin Jackson just sitting around, singing, chilling, relaxing. The next day, Linford would do his 100 metres, I'd do my 800 <laughs> qualifying, Sally would go and do her four hurdles. We were young, we were happy, we were mm. excited, and we were a real solid team. And, um, you know, it, it was just a brilliant experience. No, that's brilliant. Bringing it back to football, it's like you need a team around you, don't you? You know, if you're on your own, you're in a silo, you're very good at something, but just you, you don't. You need that sort of vibrant people around you, and you know that's something we'll talk about in a bit. But that's what you're trying to create with with your hubs and and stuff. But careers and <coughs> life, as we all know, <coughs> are their ups and ups and downs. And you ended up writing a book, didn't you, Diane, uh, called "Going the Distance"? And um, you wrote this. Um, you, I think it was in 1996. You wrote the book because you you had your own ups and downs. And we just touched on it briefly. Why you wrote the book, and and ultimately, I think your husband was around then, Vincent, and. Uh, he really sort of help you through some tough times mm. so the book was written to tell the story of my husband and I being falsely accused of taking performance enhancing drugs mm. uh, we were able to go to court and have that false accusation totally turned out and uh, I was vindicated and able to return back to the track it's a very difficult experience for me to relive and to, to share and the positives that have come out of that is the fact that we're still standing my husband and I um, it's something that we we think about most days if not every day mm. um, but the positive again is that um, we've been able to continue doing what we love which mm. is using sport 
for as a vehicle to inspire, to engage, and it gives us, and it certainly gives me a sense of purpose. It, it gives me the reason to uh, feel valued and to be valued. Yeah, I suppose once all that got cleared, you continued your career, you was a top athlete again, and <clears throat> at some point you have to retire. And how did you find that process? There's a lot of talk at this moment in time in football again, of this transition between being a player and retiring. It doesn't always mean people retire at 35 at the end of a, a substantial career. There's people dropping out of football all the time and they find it hard to transition into other jobs, into the vocations, because maybe they've not had education or they, they've not saved enough money. And um, yourself, you, you, did you go through say, maybe financial struggles or did, did you have like an education behind you which just kicked on? Or, how, how was it for you? I think the transition for many high performing athletes or athletes generally mm. um, is a tough one. Mm. Um, in my experience I had committed 18 years of my life from the age of 11 essentially to sport, mm. to international sport so clearly when that comes to an end either an enforced end or you know a choice uh, um, it's going to be difficult to mm. then fill those hours but also fill that same sense of purpose and the struggle for me was around identity mm. who is Diane now that she's not this international athlete and and I suppose like most athletes I went through a typical transition I went to work for the BBC I was an expert commentator nice. for a number of years Manchester won the Commonwealth Games in 2002 oh, yeah. I retired after the Sydney Olympics in 2000 so in a way the transition for me uh, was relatively smooth because I had these games to gear up towards and yeah. to look towards yeah. not as an athlete but as somebody who could add value to those championships um, but it wasn't enough just standing at the track side and, and asking people how they felt after a competition wasn't enough for me to tap into where I knew I could do more and give back. I was fortunate enough that my husband encouraged me to go to university while I was still nice. uh, competing. Uh, so I had some qualifications behind me. So what did you study down? Uh, business uh, with marketing. So I did a business degree uh, with marketing as an additional at Manchester Uni. Excellent. Um, and it just gave me an understanding of how business works mm. and the strategic side of it and it was really an invaluable opportunity for me to take up and so when I did set up the foundation with my husband uh, we had the qualifications and the backing to enable us to just go off and do what we wanted to do. Yeah, so the experience of being an athlete and being a pundit, having qualifications, a degree, give the credentials therefore to do what I, because I'm involved with you now, this this passion of really trying to help um, young children, young potential athletes in areas which sometimes don't get the opportunities. Um, so you're there within them there. So please tell us, so it's the Diane Medal Sports Foundation. It's um, a brilliant cause. You've, you've been Thank doing it now you. four or five years, have you? Well, we set up in 2010. Okay. So we're going to be celebrating our 10th birthday next year. and. The purpose of setting up the charity is really quite clear. We uh, support young people, we give them the behaviours and skills that they are going to need to become not only world class athletes but world class people. Mm. Um, so we de deal with issues within schools um, and we talk around our values of positivity, focus, commitment and acting with integrity. Mm. So how we do that is by going into to schools with a number of coaches and working and supporting young people to, to do sport, absolutely do sport, but to challenge them, to challenge their mindset, to challenge their behaviours mm. in terms of how they are developing their resilience and the opportunities that they have to, to carry on to be great people. Brilliant. So tell us um, which areas you work in within Manchester and also maybe some success stories which the, the foundation has had. So we work across the whole of Manchester if you like and, and now branching out into Greater Manchester so places like um, Mosside, Collyhurst, Withinshaw, um, we're all over wherever you see DMSF that's where we will be. Um, so uh, 
we've had so many success stories. The fact that we have young people who are engaged in our programme is enough for us. And we're talking hundreds or thousands here. So over the last three years, with support from Sport England, mm. we've had 85,000 visits wow. uh, of young people from the age of primary, so young right through to up to 18 years old, even older when they start to volunteer and give back. Mm. 85,000 visits to our programme over the last three years alone. Um, and throughout that time, we've seen a number of exciting opportunities that we're really proud of so for example we have one young lady who's on a pathway to compete in the common uh, sorry in the Olympic Games wow. in 2020 and um, we have identified her we've nurtured her we've invested and supported that journey so what age did you first sort of spot her 13 14 really but but then we've had others who just... But what's her name? So she's got the opportunity to go to the Olympics. Make sure you look out for this girl, by the <laughs> way. Amy Pratt, Brilliant. alongside our coach, Vicente Mudal, who, who has uh, worked with her over the last few years. So that's your husband. But what's, what um, actual event is it? Or? Steeplechase. The 3,000 metre steeplechase. It's going to be a tough call for her to qualify for okay. that. But we're confident. Yeah. She's confident. But the challenges are real. Mm. The challenge is to get any athlete with potential... Uh, staying in the sport then getting the backing that they need mm. getting the right competition the nutrition the mindset the mental health uh, mm. um, challenges that a lot of our young people face isn't straightforward so as an organization we see that as our job not only to provide the opportunities to open these doors for young people but to be there when they need us so Amy if she gets to the Olympics that would be fantastic but that's just her journey yeah. there are other kids who were proud of who are just still in school because they've been on the verge of either being expelled excluded <coughs> um, uh, or, or going down a, a negative road because we've been in that state of consistency in their lives they're now going to school they're achieving they're doing their GCSEs and that is also a massive success for us yeah that's absolutely brilliant so not only looking for athletes of the future but making sure there's just a social fabric within Manchester itself is stronger and there's opportunities for people to seek places where they can better themselves and be involved with people who've got real passion for young people um, so that's in the local area Dan but maybe further afield we get lots of people listening from all over the country all over the world you know how could they support the Diane Medell Sports Foundation if they want to and please do support it if you can because it's brilliant what Diane's trying to do Oh, well, thanks for this opportunity. Well, we're a registered charity, and like most charities, we are always seeking for like-minded people who want to support our journey in taking that holistic approach to nurturing a young person through the challenges of life. So have a look at our website, Diane Modell Sports Foundation. There's a, a, a donate button there that they can do very easily, very straightforward, and every penny goes towards helping those young kids, whether it's buying kit, providing food, whether it's an educational program, it's all about the young people. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So um, regarding your foundation, also you have a few different ambassadors. Tell us about a few ambassadors and also I've joined the team. Yeah. So um, I've been interested, me and Diane went down to school in, in Duckingfield a couple of weeks ago and um, we'll try and put a little clip on right at the very end of me and Dale, uh, Diane talking to, to the children. We had a good fun, didn't we? Yeah, we did actually. We went in and uh, we both presented this assembly and typical sports people, we got them up on their feet, exactly. didn't we, and got them involved in activity so that we could then focus their minds on that physical and mental uh, well-being really good fun and it's great to have you as part of the team thank you Dan um, and you'll know one of our other ambassadors very well Quinton Fortune yeah well Quinton's been on the show make sure you watch that show by the way the Quinton Fortune interview excellent and, and like him both of you are the epitome of what we stand for and the messages we give out um, hard work work ethic resilience applying yourself mm. if one door closes you just keep pushing it down and you go again and you keep pushing forward that is the ethos that is the values they're the behaviors and and character that we try to develop and build in our young people so our ambassadors on the face of it may look like individuals 
individuals who have achieved amazing things, mm -hmm. which, which for the most part you have, but actually it's a few layers down that we're really concerned with. Yeah. It's about having those ambassadors that can share their stories, because our kids are sitting at home on the settee watching you guys play football, watching you know the artists and the entertainers perform, but what we do with our ambassadors is bring them in, bring them to life so mm -hmm. that they can share their stories uh, with our young people and say, hey, pull your socks up, that's not good enough, or brilliant, give them a pat on the back and say, come on, you can do this. Well, brilliant. Um, well, Diana, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, please help Diana out with, the, the, with some type of donation because what she's doing is absolutely amazing. Diane, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thanks, um, I look man. forward to more work with you and um, your trust. It's something called relaxation. In the day, you're doing lots of things. It's also very important that you learn how to control your body as well. So breathe in, relax in, visualize in your mind, and really help to stay balanced. Sometimes if you get stressed, there's different ways you can alleviate it. And one of them is by doing deep breathing like that. Okay? Even if you feel like you're a little bit unsure, you're a bit panicking, do some nice deep breaths if you're worried. Or you can use one of these balls, some of you will be getting, okay? You can you just squeeze it. It can help you to accomplish the best of all, just to relax, okay? Because life's difficult sometimes, eh? You need to learn how to relax. Even when it's raining like today, I could fulfill my dream and become an Olympic runner. I did all those things that were asked of me. I turned up, I turned up on time. I had the right kit on. It was a brand new kit, but it was the right kit. But more importantly, the right attitude to work hard. Because of my link up with the first national football club we spoke about before, they said, I told them I'm coming to the school. I'm really proud to say that when you leave school today, everybody is going to get a free ticket for you and your parents to go to any game from now to the end of the season. Okay, I probably have two really big incidents. The first one was playing for Man United the very first time. And I'm talking when I was 15 here, okay? Not even, not my debut when I was an adult. 15 years old, and that's not far from where you guys are, you know? I got the opportunity to go for a trial. I put that on that Man United strip. And it just felt amazing. Okay, so that was the first one. And the second one, without doubt, is when I had the opportunity when I played in the last game of the season to go and pick up that Premier League. Imagine that feeling, you know, picking going up on the stage and picking the Premier League up to be a Premier League champion. That was a, an absolutely amazing feeling. And a bit like Diane, what she said about going to the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games, there's no better feeling than when you get that feeling like you've achieved something, but you've put so much hard work and effort into. You know, and it wasn't just me, it was also my parents who took me to all these places and the coaches who coached me through all these different levels and for me to stand there with that trophy was like the, the greatest sort of end point and um, yeah, that was definitely the, the best. My greatest success would be two things. The first would be qualifying for the Olympic Games. When you qualify for the Olympic Games, you get a letter from the Queen. She sends you a letter that comes to your home that says, uh, you have been invited to represent Great Britain at the 23rd Olympic Games. And I'm opening that letter, you can just begin to imagine how proud I was, but how proud my coach was and my parents. That was a really important moment for me. And the second would be winning a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. It was, um, it was just brilliant.